Our epistle reading this morning comes from the second letter from Paul to the church in Corinth, from the fourth chapter, verses 5 through 12. I invite you to follow along in your pew Bibles on page 939. Listen now for a word from God. For we do not proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and as ourselves, as slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is God who said, light will shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the faith face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in clay jars, so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, and struck down, but not destroyed always carrying around in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus will be made visible in our bodies. For we who are living and always being handed over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be made in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So have you ever made an absolute mess of things? The kind of mess where you don't even know where to begin cleaning up or how long it will take? I can remember one time when I was growing up, when I was old enough to be trusted at home by myself without a babysitter for the few hours after school before my parents got home but young enough that it still felt like a big responsibility to me. I was supposed to come home, take the dog for a walk, get started on my homework before the neighborhood carpool arrived to take me off to soccer practice. That's what I was supposed to do. But as I opened the pantry one day, looking for an afternoon snack, my eyes fell on the box of cherry jello on the shelf. Seeing the Jerry Jello, I decided I would do that instead. Mistake number one. I started on the recipe, boiling the water and pouring it over the Cherry Jello powder packet and stirring it in until all the powder was dissolved. And as I stirred, I decided that I would carry the pot of boiling hot jello water mixture over to the living room to turn on the TV. <laughs> Mistake number two. I tripped over the stairs and spilled jello water all over the carpet. And after spending an hour with carpet cleaner and paper towels trying to pick it up, there was still an enormous jello stain, sticky and red, all over the carpet when the carpool arrived to pick me up. Unsure of what to do and afraid of the consequences, I left the stain grabbed my bag, locked up the house, and left for soccer practice as if nothing had happened. Mistake number three. (laughs) The title for this sermon is Life's a Mess. Does that feel about right, right about now? As we continue to recover from the hurricane last weekend, even with the acute crisis of the storm past, it feels like there is still so much cleaning up to do. For me, it started cleaning out my fridge and freezer, throwing away all the food that had gone bad, wiping down the shelves, tackling the pile of laundry that had built up over the last two weeks. In our community, teams of workers have been working diligently, cleaning up debris from the streets and in our yards. And in our work and school lives, we have turned to the work of putting things in order, assessing what was missed over the last couple weeks, rescheduling events, and quickly preparing for those things which have arrived on our calendars much quicklier, much more quickly than we expected. 
It's uncomfortable to be in that place where life is still a little messy. Like good Presbyterians, we would prefer that things were decent and in order. We would love for things to return to normal as quickly as possible and for the disruption of the past couple weeks to exit our lives as quickly as it arrived. We would love to handle whatever life throws at us with a sense of cool and ease. We'd like to smile like everything is fine, even when it's not. And we wonder what to do with the places of our lives that cannot be easily tidied, wiped down, picked up, and put away. The disruption to school and work schedules, the grief for places like Western North Carolina and Florida, and the fear that something like this could happen at any time. Even when the cleaning up is done, it might seem like life remains a little messy. Paul, the Apostle Paul, of course, is no stranger to the messiness of life. He writes this second letter to the Corinthians after what he, after what he calls a painful visit with the church in Corinth. We don't know exactly what caused the visit to be painful, but we do know that there was some sort of altercation, public confrontation, which has disrupted their relationship. In chapter 2, Paul says, I write to you out of much distress and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love I have for you. His relationship with this church isn't firm or neat or all put together. Concerns have started to arise among the Corinthians about Paul's leadership, his integrity, and his authority as a teacher. And so as he writes, Paul acknowledges that their relationship is a little bit messy and there's some cleaning up to do. This letter is Paul's way of picking up the pieces, so to speak, and putting them back together with this community that he loves. In the letter, Paul talks about life and death, about repentance and forgiveness, and about reconciliation. And for Paul, this work is central to what he believes about Jesus. He says, For we do not proclaim ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as servants for Jesus' sake. As much as he might like to walk away from the messiness of the relationship there, cut his losses with the church in Corinth, and go on as if nothing happened, he can't. And so he dives into the messy and uncomfortable work of repairing their relationship together. At the heart of our text for today is the image that Paul uses. We have this power, this treasure in clay jars, so that it might be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. I'm struck by the power of that image. On the one hand, the precious treasure that is the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in Jesus Christ, And on the other, ordinary, simple clay pots. Clay pots which are made from the most ordinary, common material, earth mixed with water. Clay pots which, if you've ever taken a pottery class, you know are quite messy to make, leaving you covered in mud and slip. Clay pots which are fragile, which can be dropped, which break. And Paul says that this is the way that we carry Christ within us. We are the pots, ordinary, fragile, messy. And yet we carry within us something which is so precious that can shine into the most shattered places of our lives. He says we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Paul is appealing to their shared faith and experience as early Christians, 
He char- which is characterized often by persecution at the hands of Roman authorities and struggle against powers which felt threatened by this movement of early Christians. But Paul is also speaking to the fragile nature of their relationship, still tender from the pain of their recent visit, still full of unresolved feelings and words left unsaid, still uncertain if there is a way forward together. For Paul, the ordinary, the messy, the fragile places of our lives aren't something to be avoided, something to be swept under the rug, something to be tucked neatly away. No, these messy places are the very places in our lives where we encounter the risen Christ, who entered the messiness of this world, who took, fle- who took on flesh and became ordinary and fragile, and who died so that even the messiest and most tragic places of our lives might be redeemed and transformed by the grace of God. Last week in worship together, we celebrated the sacrament of communion, and we proclaimed the death of Jesus Christ. And even as I say those words, the messiness of the crucifixion, of what that means, makes me uncomfortable. I'm much more comfortable with the clean and tidy language of new life, of resurrection, of Easter. But as we proclaimed the vulnerability of a God in a moment when so much of us felt our own vulnerability, as we proclaimed the transformation of a death in a moment where death felt so present, I am sure that we carry the light and the life of Christ. And the life of Christ was revealed in us again and again this week in the ways that we showed up in the messiness of the world, in the cleaning up and in the places that cannot be cleaned up. In Christ, Christ was there in all the ways that our community came together as we shared resources and offered care as we waded in the messy and uncomfortable waters of cleaning up. Christ was there as people gathered each morning to make coffee for one another. Christ was there as restaurants distributed food to neighbors without power. Christ was there as United Ministries collected donations to distribute to the community. Christ was there when you opened your home to someone to take a hot shower who still didn't have power. Christ was there as you navigated with uncertainty the reopening of schools and childcare. Christ was there as you sent that text message checking in on a friend or neighbor or family member. Christ was there because it is in the messiness of the world that Christ shows up. I remember that day that I spilled jello on the carpet, uh, my mother telling me that she was upset about the stain, but she was more upset that I hadn't told her about it, that I had continued on with my day as though nothing had happened, that I didn't ask for help, that I didn't own the mess that I had made. And so I wonder what it would have looked like that day if I had stuck around in the discomfort, if I had admitted what had happened, and if I would asked for help. I wonder what it would look like for us as the church to own the messiness of our lives, what it would look like to be honest about the messes we've created and the ones we find ourselves in through no fault of our own. And I wonder what it would look like to trust that in the messiness is where Jesus shows up and to look for the ways we are being transformed in that mess. Amen.